Well, I'm excited to continue our series on increase today and want to start with a video that I saw recently. So here is maybe just a little insight into my mind. Uh, I'm Kendall, one of the pastors and leaders here, and I can struggle sometimes uh, when God calls his people sheep in the Bible. I don't like being labeled as a sheep, okay? I don't know about you guys, but sheep, they're a little boring, you know, a little monotonous, a little dirty, a little smelly, not very smart, and you're kind of like, really, God, couldn't be a duck or, you know, uh, I'll take a sheep dog, you know, a sheep, and, and so then I saw this video, and I was like, you know what, I think, I think there actually may be more in this sheep thing than I first thought. There's, there may be something that God is breathing into this idea that he is leading us creatively, creatively in this season as his sheep, and he is our shepherd. So I came across this video. It's known as the second most creative commercial of all time. It's by Samsung, and it's called Extreme Sheep LED. So I want you to watch this video real quick to get an idea of the kind of sheep that God wants to raise up in this church in this season. These guys are about to herd some sheep, okay? Extreme shepherding. We're getting there. We're getting there. Well, that's better. That's better. That's better. That's more like it now. Stand. Stand there. Now we're herding some sheep. It gets boring out there in the field. These shepherds need something to do. Some of you guys are that cheap. Start on the next page. Yes, that's better. That's good. That's good. Looking good. Naturally. Leonardo Bavinci. Come on, let's clap for these extreme sheep. Wish I'd thought of that. You know, what if the Christian life isn't as boring as you might think? <laughs> what, if, what if we're all a little more unique than we give ourselves credit for, and God wants to do something more creative in our life than we ever imagined? This morning, I want to speak to you from the subject, increasing your creativity increasing your creativity. And I believe God has a creative word for you in this season because I want to be a part of a, of a church with those kind of sheep, the extreme LED sheep. How about you? Okay, God's making something really cool out of what he's doing here. And I want to, I want to start this, this message by, by maybe pointing out one of the more unique, um, one of the more creative miracles we see in the Bible. We're going to go through this miracle today in the life of Elisha, who is an Old Testament prophet. We're going to see how God uses this creative miracle to tell a story about his own creative power in our lives. So turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. If you want to pull up the translation we're using, we're in the New Living Translation as we focus on increasing and in creativity today during this season of increase. Let me read the passage for us, and then we'll break it down. 
2 Kings verse 6. One day, the group of prophets came to Elisha. Remember, Elisha is the chief prophet, and he has this group of prophets he's leading. And they tell him, as you can see, the place where we meet with you is too small. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. Sounds a lot like the light project, doesn't it? Okay. All right. He told them, go ahead. Please come with us, someone suggested. I will. Speaking of Elijah, Elisha, he said, so he went with them. When they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. But as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe head fell into the river. So they're using an axe. Brought my axe here. Jason gave me this axe to cut down some plants in my backyard. Okay, so they have an axe. They're chopping down a tree. The axe head flips off and sinks into the water. Oh, sir, he cried. That was a borrowed axe. No, that wasn't mine. I borrowed it. Where did it fall? The man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut out a stick. This is a stick I cut out of a bottle breast tree this morning at my house. So he cut down a stick and he threw it into the water at that spot. He throws the stick into the water, and then the axe head floats up out to the surface. Grab it, Elisha said. And the man reached out and grabbed it. What an interesting story. We're going to break this down today because God has some keys in this story for us about to increase our creativity. Here's my first point. In order to increase in creativity, you have to see the opportunity to be creative. You have to see the opportunity to be creative. Let me just go over the first part of this passage again. One day, the group of prophets came to Elisha and said, kids, you can see the place where we meet with you is too small. I like the message translation of that verse. It says, as you can see, we are cramped and have no elbow room. (laughs) If you've ever been in, in one of our early education rooms here at the church, sometimes it feels cramped. Sometimes we're lacking in a little elbow room. We're actually rearranging our whole office this week for that reason. Okay, so they're cramped. There's no elbow room. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, he told them, go ahead. So here's the first thing I see in this passage as we're looking for the opportunity to be creative is that this was a season of increase. This was a season of growth in Elisha's ministry. They had some kind of a camp or location where he's training all these young prophets. He's the head prophet, and they're coming to him, and they're saying, Elisha, we're all out of space. We need to expand. We need to grow, okay? And so then they go find this new place, and they see it as an opportunity for uh, for increase. A couple notes on increase. Increase is not always convenient, right? Not, Not always convenient to make room for new things in our life, is it? right? Back in my day, I was raised in a more traditional denominational church, and we sat at the same pew every Sunday. Man, you wouldn't want to sit in somebody else's pew, would you, right? That would be inconvenient, okay? But when we make room for more people in a church or in our lives, there's going to have to be more space, right? Increase is not always convenient, and increase requires creativity, That's why Jesus said, new wine always goes into new wineskins. There has to be creativity. There has to be new containers to to hold what God is doing in our lives when he's doing something new. So I think of the creativity required for this little building project. They had to find a plot of land. They had to find logs. Apparently, they had to borrow an axe head. I'm assuming they borrowed some other tools. They prepared the work. They had to move the people. They had to raise some funds. And then there was this group of prophets. And, you know, personally, I would be a little worried if a group of prophets came to me and said, I'm going to build you a house. I'd rather have a group of carpenters. I don't know about you. Prophets sometimes have weird ideas, right? But nope, these, there's creative prophets. They're going to come build this great ministry center. And Elisha's like, go for it. So, okay. But they had a vision. And, you know, you've probably experienced this in some season in your life, right? Increase comes into your life whether it's more responsibility at work, whether it's a new child in your house, right? Whether it's a new roommate, whether it's just, you know, anything that God adds to your life and you have to get creative to contain the increase, right? And one of the things that can happen when increase comes into our life is the, the, old, the old containers, the old things that actually used to serve us in a previous season, they feel restricting, That's why we don't put teenagers in swaddles, right? 
right? As things mature in our life and as things grow, they need creative space. And so when growth comes into our, in our lives, it's an opportunity for creativity, but we can oftentimes look at it as an inconvenience, can't we? Right? Growth is an opportunity for creativity, and I believe right now we're in more of an opportunity for creative increase that we have been in for generations. This is a creative season and something that God is calling to the church. Why, why do I say that? Because he said that increase is coming, A, B, because there's greater need for the kingdom of God in our culture than ever before. And somebody saying amen, right? We see that. We see the need for increase. And I'm reminded um, of a promise that the Lord gave me in April of 2020. I think for most of us, March of 2020, April 2020, May 2020, not pleasant months, right? A lot of pain, a lot of challenges, a lot of confusion, things we're dealing with. And during that time, as a spiritual leader, here is what I knew. I would not make it through that crisis without a word from God. I would not make it through that crisis without a a promise from God, like just personally being responsible for leading people, for managing a church. We didn't know what was going to happen with the church financially. We didn't know if we were going to be able to meet. We didn't know. There's so much uncertainty. And I just knew if I don't have a promise from God, I won't be able to lead through this season. And I needed to get some time with God, but my kids were home because they were doing remote school and I had no personal time. Anyone else feel that in 2020? All right, so one night I finally get some time to really pray and seek the Lord and God gives me this promise. This is what he says. After this crisis will come a renaissance of hope. After this crisis will come a renaissance of hope. And sometimes God speaks something to you and it's, it's kind of like encouraging. Like that's encouraging. You know, that's a nice thought. I'll write it down in my devotional, ver- my devotional. you know, kind of like, just, just that's neat. Other times God speaks something to you and it's kind of like a virus. It kind of gets into your computer programming and it starts messing everything up. This was like that. It was just this, idea, what is a renaissance? I mean, this the idea, I just couldn't get it out of my mind. It was just, I was meditating on it constantly. And I thought, hope, well, that's, that's significant. That's something that people need. But what about this word, renaissance. What about this idea of a renaissance? And, and I looked up the definition of the word renaissance. You might be familiar with it. It means rebirth or revival, kind of a spiritual word, okay? And I began to study, okay, well, let's look at the Italian renaissance in world history. So if God is saying that a renaissance of hope is coming, like what were the conditions surrounding probably the most famous renaissance in world history, the most famous kind of time of cultural change, and people, historians look at it as a time of wealth creation, artistic achievement, societal transformation. What was going on at that time? Here's what I saw about the conditions in history prior to the Italian renaissance. I just want to point them out to you real quick. So first of all, there was a time of great war. Um, the nation states in Europe were vying for power, and so it was a time of great conflict and war. It was not a time of peace prior to the Renaissance. Then we have the Black Plague, like there were the Dark Ages. So there was a disease that spread throughout the entire earth. There was a lot of loss of life. There was a need for religious reformation. Prior to the, the Renaissance, which eventually coincided with the Protestant Reformation in church history, all of the religious power was wrapped up in the Catholic Church. And unfortunately, one of the things you see when you read history is absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that power got into spiritual leaders, and they started to manipulate people. There was, there was financial impropriety. There was sexual impropriety. There was just abuses of power that were coming through the church and negatively affecting people's lives. But then all of a sudden, you see these technological developments. There's the printing press. There's new forms of architecture and art. And then this learning and culture starts to flourish. As these technological developments create wealth, people start to gather to cities for opportunity. And finally, what happens is God births a spiritual renewal. In world history, we call it the Reformation, the spiritual renewal in new forms. I thought, wow, that's so interesting. And then I thought, okay, well, is there a renaissance in the Bible? Is, is there a time in the Bible that we'd look and we'd say, this is kind of a time of cultural, of cultural renaissance, of cultural change? Um, and then I thought of, well, yes, of course, it's Israel under Solomon. It's the time in the Bible where you see just like God's prosperity and God's hand just coming on a kingdom. And it's probably the most prosperous time in Israel's history. And I thought, well, what were the conditions 
what were the conditions before this renaissance in Israel, before Israel under Solomon? And I, and I wrote those out just with some different Bible thoughts. First of all, there was a great war. The Bible says that David, Solomon's father, was a man of war. And so it was a time of great war that happened uh, during David's life. Then there was a great plague because of David's sin. Actually, a plague was brought onto Israel as a form of divine judgment. There was a need for religious reformation. I could go through all the different Bible characters and all through their sins. I don't have time for that, but just to say this was a time of brokenness in the people of God. There was a time of technological development and building of cities. If you ever read just the description of Israel under Solomon and Solomon's kingdom, it's amazing the kind of growth and creativity and architecture and economy that they had at that time in ancient Israel. It was a time of learning, culture, and art. And then finally, there's a spiritual renewal. Solomon builds the temple, and a new form of worship is created. Are you tracking with me? I was thinking, wow, there's some parallels here between the Italian Renaissance and this Renaissance under Solomon. So I begin to think, well, what, where are those conditions present in our world today? Where do we see those, those conditions? Okay, it seems like, first of all, we're entering into a time of geopolitical conflict. Jeff and Oksana are here from Moldova. Just want to, again, honor them as our pastors of all peoples Moldova. They've been in the middle of this conflict that's been happening between Ukraine and Russia, this invasion. So th- this is a time of war. I believe there'll be more war, so there'll be more conflict, okay? Well, well, what else do we see today? Yeah, there's been a plague, like there's been a disease that's affected the whole world. What else do we see today? Is there a need for religious reformation? I mean, turn on the news, right? Every time you watch the news, there's some Christian leader. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. You know, people just falling from, into sin, and it's all on public display. I mean, it's very challenging. Is this a time of technological development? Yeah, I think so. Wow, it seems like we are ripe for another renaissance within the kingdom of God. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we need to have better church services. This church has great services, by the way. I'm not talking about a renaissance in the church. I'm talking about a renaissance from the church, something that touches our city and our society and releases the kingdom of God with a new hope-filled expression. We have to see the opportunity. Yeah, like there's been some hard stuff that's happened, but, but I think God is preparing the world for something fresh and new. One thing I do know, if an increase is coming, we're going to need to tap into God's creativity to steward that increase. Can I get an amen? Okay, so there's the first thought. See the opportunity. Man, sometimes we, we see challenges in our life, and, and actually God wants to see them as opportunities. I've started calling my alarm clock an opportunity clock. Every time I wake up in the morning, I have an opportunity. Somebody's going to take that one. You're going to be a better spouse when you wake up in the morning. All right, better roommate. Good, see the opportunity. Please continue. Oh, okay. Please come with us. So here's the next part of the story. Back to Elisha. Please come with us. So the the prophets now are inviting Elisha into their building campaign. Please come with us, someone suggested. I will, he said. So he went with them. This might be a couple throwaway verses to you, but there's actually something deeper happening here. And it all goes back to who Elisha represents in the story. You see, the builders knew that they would need Elisha with them. They knew that they would need Elisha with them. And and when you study the Old Testament, there's different people in the Old Testament that have different symbolism for us today as modern-day Christians. And what theologians will tell you is that Elisha is a prototype. Elisha is a precursor of the ministry of Jesus. You see, Elisha's name means the Lord saves. What does Jesus mean? The Lord saves. Elisha performed many of the same miracles as Jesus, multiplying food, raising the dead, setting people free. Elisha ministered in the same area as Jesus. And so we see as we study the Old Testament that Elisha is a precursor. He's a symbol. He's a sign of Jesus. How does this relate? Please come with us. So he went with them. We don't ever want to enter into a new season without the presence of God, right? Remember, remember how God would lead his people throughout the wilderness? He would go before them, right? We want God to go before us into any new place he's leading us. We don't want to enter into a new season without the presence of God because if it's creativity we need, it's God himself we need because God is creative. God is a creator. 
So here's my second point on increasing your creativity. See God as the creator. See God as the creator. Man, it's so fun living in Southern California, right? In any given day, you can be in the desert, the beach, the mountains. I'm trying to think of another another ecology. Well, you can drive to Anaheim and go to the Rainforest Cafe. So you can be in the rainforest too. All right. You can be in all of it in one day. But God's so creative in how he created the world. And one of the things we see, one of the things we see in the Bible is when something's mentioned the first time, it's very significant. It's called the law of first mention. It's supposed to set the tone. It's an essential, it's an essential building block for understanding that concept. So think about it this way. How does God introduce himself in the Bible? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created. It's the very first revelation of God. Before we understand, understand God as healer, before we understand God as provider, before we understand God as savior, we understand that God is creator. Isn't that interesting? Even, uh, even secular scientists understand this. I read this book, A Brief History of Time. Okay, by Stephen Hawking. And I read through the book, and then the, it goes to the last page, and it's this atheist um, physicist, and he's asking where the universe came from. So he's sharing all his theories. And this was the quote from the last page of this atheist book. This is what it said. If we find the answer to the origin of the universe, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason. For then we would know the mind of God. Uh. Even an atheist has no way to frame the conversation about the origin of our world outside of God. God is preeminent. He is supreme. He is creator. He is alpha. He is first. I mean, you just think about every, every culture has a creation myth about how the world was made. Every person I've never met a person, even the, maybe the most shallow person, you know, there's been one night in their life they'd stayed up late, just staring at the ceiling, wondering, where did this all come from? <laughs> We've all want asked that question, right? It's because God has put eternity in our hearts, and he's wanting us to reach out and look for meaning in this world because creation points back to him, right? And so God is creator, man. If you're here today and you are, if you're a seeker, if you're still figuring out this whole church thing or this whole God thing or this whole Jesus thing, I just want to tell you, there is one indisputable fact about your life. As God created you, he had a purpose for your life and he created this very moment in your life for you to reach out and touch him and receive his love. God is creator. Back to Elisha. When they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. We were actually doing this on our church property this week. We were having to cut down some trees because of some, you know, some fire code and things of that nature. God is creator, right? And, and so if God is creator and we are made in his image, what do we do? We create. We work. We build things. We do stuff, right? Right? God made us creative. I mean, I see this in my kids. My kids, like, were born wanting to build with Legos. I hate Legos. Like, I mean, last night, I stepped on a Lego. It, I had a piercing scream, right, came from the inner depths of my soul, right? I mean, I have a whole floor, a whole basement of my house that's been taken over by these Lego Mario things. Have you guys seen these things? Oh, my goodness. I got Legos coming out my ears, right? But there's something in my kids. They're made in the image of God, and they want to build. They want to create. And I think, that's how, I think that's how we all are if we really think about it. We all have our creative pursuit. We all have that thing we love to do that gives us life, that gives us joy, Maybe it's something that's outside. Maybe it's something in your hands. Maybe it's something with your minds. But God has put his creative image in you. So you, some people, it's building their family. It's being a parent. Like they love to be creative with that. Other people, it's the workplace. But we all have a creative bent. We have something that we like to lean into with creativity. And maybe you've noticed this, that when God created the world, he actually didn't give us tables and chairs. He didn't give us houses. Like, he didn't even give us a surfboard. He gave us trees. And so God actually expects creativity from us. 
because he knows we're made as in, in his image. So the, the, the next step to, to increasing in creativity, first of all, we have to see God rightly, but then we have to see ourselves rightly. You're creative, right? Some of you are like, yeah, I've been real creative at messing up my life. No, no, God, God actually has, has a genius he's put in you. He has something of his beauty that he's put in you, and he wants you to express. Look at your neighbor and say, you are creative. You're creative. You guys don't want to look at your neighbor. Okay, well, the 9 a.m. did. All right, so let, let, let me build a theology of this a little bit. Okay, Adam's first job. God creates man and woman, Adam and Eve, and then he gives Adam a job. What's Adam's first job? Genesis 2.20, creating the names of the animals. Right? I don't know whether he did it in Hebrew or those weird Latin names. I don't know what language he was speaking, but he named the animals. Okay, it's a creative. Like, how do you come up with the name for a white-tailed deer? I don't know. So, well, probably has a white tail. That might be a good place to start. Maybe, Adam, no, Adam was creative. Okay, the first mention of making something in the Bible. Like, God speaks to Noah. He says, Noah, I want you to make something for me. I want you to build something for me. And Noah's like, what is it? And God's like, it's an ark. Noah's like, what's that? <laughs> it required some creativity. And then God says, oh, by the way, this ark is going to protect you from the coming rain. And then Noah's like, what's that? It had never rained before. I mean, what a creative story. Genesis 11, like when people come together, what do they do? They create, right? Have you ever been to Comic-Con in downtown San Diego? All the crazy outfits, all the things people do. When people come together, they love to create, and, and that's what happened. Genesis chapter 11, the nations come together, and then they get this idea. We should build something. We're pretty good. We should create something ourselves. Let's big a build tower, the, the Tower of Babel. They create. It was just in human nature. I'm not saying it was good, but it was just in there. There was something in there. They needed to build. They needed to create. Genesis chapter 12, what happens when God blesses a man? He creates through him. He creates a nation. He creates a family. You're creative. I'm not letting you off the hook. God says that you're creative. But here's what's so heartbreaking is the church has often been more creative critic than creative coach. I mean, let's just be real. Like, there's a lot of us that have had a religious experience with no room for creativity. That's why I love that sheep video. <laughs> there's something fresh that God's doing in our community in this time. He wants to release you into fresh creativity. And I believe there's been some creative casualties in the church. I believe there's some people that God wanted to breathe his creative life through, but the full expression didn't happen. I was uh, over, over the holiday break last year, my wife and I went to a Vincent Van Gogh art exhibit. And it was one of these immersive art exhibits. It's like 3D. Has anyone been to one of these where you kind of walk into it? It's really cool. Okay, one of us, well, you'll, you'll understand this illustration. So you walk into this art exhibit, and the actual art isn't there, but it's like, it's like VR, and you, you learn the story of the life of the artist. And so I was excited just to see the virtual reality, but what I wasn't expecting was to be so impacted about the life of Vincent Van Gogh. Because I walked away just with this, like, deep, like, something God was doing in my heart because his life was all about his relationship with God and how it remained unfulfilled because of pain in the church. You see, Vincent Van Gogh, he was raised as a young man. Uh, I think this is what he looked like. Here's his picture. If you don't know who I'm talking about, Vincent Van Gogh, that's Vincent right there. Okay, here's probably his most famous painting, Starry Night. Um, sad story. He actually painted it from, from the window of his insane asylum near his death. He had a very tragic life. We can go back to a picture of, of Vincent now. Uh, and Vincent uh, was, was in France in the late 1800s, and he had a desire to serve God. And his father, okay, was a minister a minister of the Dutch Reformed Church. His mother's grandfather was also a minister. So he was, he was from a ministry family. He kind of thought, okay, I'm going to serve God, and I'm going to do it in the context of church. He had a heart for God. He felt a call to ministry. But because he was a creative, he had some learning differences. Maybe you relate to that. Maybe you've had some learning differences. Maybe you've had some challenge finding your way in an academic system or in a church or, or fitting in. That was Vincent, that was Vincent Van Gogh. And so the, he goes to Amsterdam, which is the main uh, place of the Dutch Reformed uh, denomination, and he fails the entrance exam to get into their ministry school. So kind of washes out, 
tries a couple years later, gets some mentoring, and then he goes to Brussels, and he enters into a three-month evangelism school. So our school of transformation is nine months. So this is like even easier than the school of transformation, and he can't even get into that. They won't even let him into that. And so he has a lot of disappointment, and so he tries one more time. He goes to his uncle, who is also a traveling minister, and he says, hey, I really have this call to be a missionary. Can you help me? And so his uncle helps him get a missionary post. And so they send him out, okay, into the outskirts um, of town where the coal miners live. Probably the worst missionary assignment. Like, you know, a coal miner, not like a super friendly guy, right? You know, covered in dust, you know, probably, probably use some language that we wouldn't use here, you know. Uh, pro- probably some hard to reach people. And he goes and gets sent out to the coal miners. And he has this idea. He says, well, God has sent me to reach these people. And, but the church has provided me this big house to stay in, so I'm warm. But the people that I'm reaching, they're cold and destitute. They're living in tents. And so he just decided, well, I'm going to be incarnational. I'm going to live like them. So he moves out of his big missionary house that the denomination is paying for, and he moves into a tent. And then he gives the house to all the coal miners. So like wrecking this house, okay? And then the traveling supervisor comes in town, right? And he sees, okay, Vincent's over here in a tent. Our house is getting wrecked. This is not going to work. They fire Vincent. They kick him out of the denomination. And, you know, this brought a deep season of emotional pain into his life. He turned to drinking. Of, of course, you know, he was an cr- incredible artist, and I think that was probably part of how he coped with some of his pain. But unfortunately, he only had a few short years of, of productive artistic life, and he lived a very tragic life and died a tragic early death. And... You know, I was just kind of looking for a nice little afternoon of looking at sunflower paintings. And I'm leaving this Vincent Van Gogh exhibit, and I'm just, like, wrecked. And I'm just like, God, like, let it not be that, you know, the genius that you have put in people at our church gets squashed or neglected or cast aside. And, and th- that leads them into a place of emotional pain where they can't live out their calling. Like, and, and I just was seeing, oh, my gosh, like, th- there, there are times, like, where people who want to live creatively become casualties of a religious system. I mean, there's one way you can look at the life of Jesus like that. And, man, I want to live a church that's the create, I want to be in a church that's the creative LED sheep church, right? I want to be releasing people into their creative callings and into their creative gifts. And, and I want to believe for happy endings for the lives of different creatives where they have fulfilled their greatest potential in society and in the kingdom of God. That's the kind of church I want to be in. What about you? Um, you know, God has been giving me this, this image for our church a lot of times, and I've done it before, just full, full disclosure, I've done this before, okay? A lot of times preachers, when they really want to get a crowd going, they'll say something like this. You know, the church isn't a cruise ship, it's a battleship. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, we're a battleship. We're not those lame cruise ship Christians. Wow, nervous laughter. Okay. <laughs> I'll try this side. Jason's super radical, so he'll get this. Okay, so, but, but really... When I've walked away from those illustrations, you know what I've thought? Like, can I just be honest with you? I kind of like cruise ships. It's all inclusive. There's a water slide. But surely there's a place for a cruise ship in God's kingdom. That's a big kingdom. And you, you know what? God spoke to me and said, I'm not calling all people's church to be simply a big battleship. I'm calling you to build a fleet. You know what? In a fleet, there's cruise ships. There's people in this tent that have the ministry of refreshment. That's awesome. In a fleet, there's little dinky catamarans, you know, and you're just kind of hanging out, and you have that cool little, um, you know, trampoline thing in the middle between the two holes, and, man, we want to be your friend, by the way, okay, if you got one of those, right? There's, there's canoeing people, right, and you're just slugging it out, you're intense, awesome, good for you, right? There's, there's, there's submarine people, they go real deep in the Holy Spirit, they emerge every couple years, right? And you're like, hey, good to see you again, right? But, but do you know how World War II was won? It wasn't won through one ship, it was won because of the Pacific Fleet, And that's our inheritance here in San Diego. I believe God is raising up a fleet of creative ministry, of creative expression, of all different types of gifting. 1 Corinthians 12 says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the common good. God has a ministry for you. 
in the church and out of the church, a place to transform society, something creative, something unique. Oh, what was I talking about? Okay. Oh, that's the kind of church that I want to have. I don't know about you. Verse 5. So you got to see yourself as creative. you got to see God as creative. But as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe fell into the river. Oh, sir, he cried. That was a borrowed axe. Has that ever happened to you before? You, like, borrowed someone's tool and it breaks, right? It's happened to me. There's so many things going on in this story. And the one way you can read this is a story about financial provision, right? This was a time of economic downturn. This is a, a depression economically in Israel. Like, they have this borrowed tool. It's made of iron. It's valuable. They lose it. God provides, and he gets them out of debt. That's awesome. And if that's the interpretation that you need today, I just want to bless you with that, because I really believe that God wants to provide for you in this time of economic downturn. But there's also something symbolically that I think God wants us to see here. Because the axe head, when we look at the Bible, it represents human strength. That's what, that's what iron represents when you study the Bible. Iron represents human strength. Strength. It actually represents how we try to combine our strength with God's strength sometimes, right? And, and the loss of I'm an axe head in the Jordan River, right, would represent how our natural power cannot accomplish God's supernatural will, right? So, so there's, this, there's this element of human strength, and there's this loss of that in the Jordan River. And this illustrates this spiritual principle of, like, apart from God, there is no true spiritual creative power. Like, there's something God is calling us to in our season, which is to say, hey, you think you have tools, you think you have talents, you think you have gifts, are you willing to lay those down so I can fill them with my power? Okay? Maybe you faced this situation before in business, like work, whatever. You face a situation, a meeting, a person, just seemed impossible. They're hard-hearted. The answer's a hard no. Don't ask me again. And, and you're out of options, what do you do? You have to let that axe head sink. You have to surrender your tools and your solutions to God. And say, my natural talent, my natural gifts, my tools won't get me there anymore. But God, I just confess that my, your power is greater than my power. Verse 6, they go to Elisha for help. Where did it fall? The man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick, okay, and threw it into the water at that spot, okay? Then the axe head floated to the surface, okay? I didn't do super well in high school physics, but I do remember this. What goes up must come, okay? I don't remember a page in my physics book that says this. When something goes down, throw something else down, and then the first thing that went down will come up. That, that doesn't make any sense, right? Okay, you're just going to have two things down at that point, okay? And I love this story because it's a creative miracle. There's nothing in the natural order that can speak to this miraculous thing of an axe head floating. And I think there's more going on here than we see. Okay, so remember, Elisha in the story, he's a precursor to Jesus. Okay, we have the axe head, which represents our own human strength. What's the branch represent? Well, well, what does the Bible say about branches? Jesus said this, I am the vine. I am the vine. You're the branches. So we're the branches. Okay, so we're the branch in the story. He says, I am the vine. You're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you don't remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away. The branch represents our dead works our inability to accomplish God's will in our own power and strength. I was meeting with a, with a business owner this week, and um, he owned four businesses, and he had just sold two. And I was just like, wow, that's amazing. You just sold two businesses. Like, congratulations, you know. And you know what he said? Oh, I said, congratulations on your success is what I said. And do you know what he said? He said, actually, I don't view it as a success. I view it as a failure, because I built those two businesses in my own strength apart from God. Wow, I want to be like that. I, I want my metric of failure and success to be whether I partnered with God in the process. Can I get an amen? Like, I think that's what it means to be a healthy branch that bears fruit that remains. Okay, so we've got Elisha representing Jesus. We've got the axe head 
representing our natural tools and talents. We've got the branch representing our dead works. And, and then we have the River Jordan. So what's going on with the River Jordan? Matthew 3.13, Jesus is baptized in the River Jordan. Okay, so that was his passageway into ministry. Okay, Joshua chapter 1, Israel is moving into the promised land. What do they have to cross? The River Jordan. That was their passageway into the promised land. What does Jordan mean? Descend. Jordan means to descend. We will always descend through a passageway of death before moving into a new thing. We will always descend through a passageway of baptism before ascending into a new purpose from God. So God's God's showing us something here. He's saying, Elisha represents Jesus. The Jordan represents baptism. The branch represents our dead works. The supernatural resurrection of an axe head is God's power being represented through the works of our hands. A companion passage here is in the life of Moses. God calls Moses. He says, hey, Moses, what's in your hand? Right? Moses is like a staff. And then he calls Moses to put it down, comes a snake, and then he picks it back up and supernaturally empowered. There's something here. There's something, there's a promise that God's giving us. It's a baptism of sorts. It's a promise of a fresh filling of the spirit for creativity. I talked a little while ago about the law of first mention. Uh, You know the first mention of someone being filled with the spirit in the Bible is for creativity? Exodus chapter 31 and Exodus chapter 35, there's people that are filled with the spirit to be creative to build God's temple. Deuteronomy 8.18, the the first mention of the power of God infusing someone is, is to create, to create wealth in that instance, entrepreneurial gifting. Of course, we see in the Bible, when people are touched by God, what happens? They start singing. (laughs) It doesn't tell us whether they were a good singer or not. It just tells us that they were singing. They're filled with God's creativity, like Psalms and Proverbs. And and I just want to transition here by asking you a couple questions. First of all, where do you need a baptism of creativity? Where, Where in your life... Are you using an old axe head? What is a tool? What's a relationship? What's something you you do maybe in your work life or your personal life? Maybe it used to work in a different season. But because God's calling you to something new, you're working harder and harder with that tool and getting less and less results. Like, Maybe you've lost the tool. Maybe it's sinking. Maybe it's your bank account. Your bank account is sinking. It's going down. Maybe it's what's going on at your kid's school. It's sinking. And go, I don't know where the, where the descending area is in your life, but there's probably somewhere where the axe head is sinking and it's no longer working. That's the area where you need a fresh baptism of creativity. Is this making sense at all? Okay. So, so we need a baptism of creativity in our lives. What do we do? When we realize that area, the Bible says this, one of the basic doctrines of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 6, repent of dead works. What's what's repent mean? Turn the other way. Say, God, I used to do it this way. I used to do it in my own strength, but I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to leave that there until you tell me to pick it up. It's the fourth step to increasing in creativity. See it right here seizing the divine moment, seizing the divine moment. Verse 7, after the axe head floats to the surface, things start moving very quickly. Grab it, Elisha said, and the man reached out and grabbed it. You know, where did Jesus say the kingdom of God was? At hand, right here. When you start to see God's work in your life, it's time to move very quickly. Don't do anything until you see God at work. But when you see God at work, then you got to go. Does that make sense? And, and some of us actually, because, because we've listened to the voice of criticism and not, and not the, the encouraging, coaching voice of the Holy Spirit, we're afraid to move forward. I want to just end with this slide. 
One of my children got some extra help at school in the last couple years, and the person that was helping him kept talking about your inner coach versus your inner critic. And man, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, he comes like an inner coach, right? Even when he convicts us, it's a righteous conviction that brings us into a fresh season in God. It's not a condemnation that makes us feel shame. What is an inner coach? What does that voice sound like in your head? You are created in the image of God, and therefore God has a creative plan for your life. What's the voice of an inner critic? You are behind, and you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> behind by whose standards? I mean, God used Lazarus, and Lazarus was dead. Inner coach, you are learning by doing, and God is working out all of your experiences for good. That's supposed to say for good. Romans 8, 28. Inner critic, hitting that identity button. You're too old. You're too young. You're too under-resourced. You're too busy. You're too tired. You're too lonely to make any progress in your life. Hmm. Inner coach, you haven't mastered it yet. Haven't mastered it. Yet, yeah, right? Sometimes uh, my wife and I will say this when we feel like there's a room in our house that's a little disorganized. We'll say, we are getting our house in order, <laughs> right? Inner critic, you need permission. Man, God's given you permission right here in his word to be creative to be the unique expression of his love that you're called to be. Inner coach, you're finding your fit. My dad says it this way, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. Right? Inner critic, you don't fit in. Man, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Right? God has a place for you in this fleet. <laughs> God has a creative expression for you in his kingdom. You are creative, and he wants you to increase in creativity. Can we all stand together?